Morning, everyone. Good to see all of you here, and hope you guys hope you guys had a good journey in. I know it's been a bit you know rough with all the road closures, but glad to see the attendance. Feel free to come forward, uh, listen in at, at the end. We'll probably have some questions as well. So, in terms of this agenda, going to do a quick introduction with our panelists. Uh, my name is David. I'm a co-founder at Drift, building the largest uh, de decentralized perpetuals exchange on Solana right now, clocking in about 10 billion in volume and essentially looking to push the DeFi frontier. But without further ado, I will quickly let our panelists introduce a little bit about their backgrounds before we kick off today's uh, agenda. So Paul, if you wouldn't mind going first. Yeah, David, thank you very much. And thank you to 2049 for inviting me here to speak today. Um, so my name is Paul Kremsky. I run business developments for Cumberland DRW. Um, I've been with DRW uh, mostly as a trader for most of my career uh, for 16 years. And I've been uh, on the uh, cryptocurrency side for about five years now. Hi guys, good to be here. Uh, my name is Philip Gillespie. I'm the CEO of B2C2. B2C2 is one of the leading uh, OTC liquidity provider in the crypto space. So this is institutional side, liquidity on spot, derivatives, funding, and everything else. Uh, before B2C2, I used to work in TradFi, uh, back in investment banks, and it's great to be back in Singapore again. Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Sum. Uh, I'm at Jane Street. Uh, Jane Street is a, a global multi-asset liquidity provider and market maker. Uh, we did our first trade in the year 2000. Uh, I joined the firm in 2003. Uh, I've traded uh, equities, ETFs, commodities, FX, volatility over the years. Um, but over the last five years, I've been focusing on crypto uh, with when we started trading in 2017. It's uh, great to be back in Asia. Thanks, guys, for the introduction. So today's discussion is going to be about the crypto market structure and recently we've seen so much take place both in the macro world which has then had impacts on crypto so i think we'll start at the very top and then slowly zoom in in terms of macro we've seen over the last two years tech companies benefiting a lot from you know, quantitative like a qe uh, a significant amount of money injecting into the space and now this trend is taking a pause so i'm curious to get you guys thoughts on how that's going to be affecting crypto businesses, tech businesses, and the crypto businesses. So if any one of you guys want to take it away and we go from there. Sure. Happy to start. So I think it's pretty, uh, anybody in finance knows easy financial conditions leads to a lot of, uh, I don't want to say laziness, but you get away with things, right? So in the last two years, with rates suppressed, um, I think valuation and multiples very high. It was easy to raise funds. It was easy to, to hit these valuation metrics. And Really, everybody talked the big game, but now once rates starts rising and the financing cost goes up, you have to really be selective on what you're delivering. It's true innovation, it's true business, it's true products and services. And it's not just crypto. I think we're going to see it you know, across all these uh, growth stocks uh, in NASDAQ and everywhere else, but especially in our super innovative, super growth industry that we're in, you know, now is the time that you kind of see the real players who are building the real businesses versus the others who were completely mispriced in terms of their valuation and the fundraising. So I think it's, it's a healthy thing. It's painful sometimes. And I'm thinking we're going to talk about credit markets and different stuff. But um, to me, now is the time to build. Now is the time to really innovate the right products and services. So one of the points that you mentioned um, during a bull market, everything is really easy and, you know, even if you're not excellent at something, you can be successful with it. And something that we see in the crypto markets, which we actually don't see in TradFi really at all, is you have a single company trying to handle multiple stacks of the trading business. So in TradFi, you're not gonna have the same company act as the exchange, the custodian, the prime broker, certainly not as a trading desk. Um, at worst, that leads to really, really serious uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, we like open, um, you know, competitive markets and vertical integration just usually doesn't lead there. Um, even if there's no conflict of interest in crypto, what you see is if you have this vertical integration, you're not getting the best user experience. The metaphor, the bad metaphor that I like to use is if you go to a restaurant and it has both sushi and pizza, like you can be very confident that it's going to be bad sushi and it's going to be bad pizza. Um, not in Japan. <laughs> yeah. And you should order the pizza. The sushi is too risky, right? Um, and in crypto, like a lot of times when institutions are coming to the space, 
They're trying to figure out everything they need to trade crypto for the first time, which is, there are a lot of hurdles. And there's a temptation to do one single onboarding that offers all of these solutions. And the case that I try to make is instead you should focus on figure out, okay, I need a custodian. Who is the best custodian for what I'm trying to do? Okay, I need a technology provider. Who's gonna be the best OMS PMS for how I wanna execute? And then I need liquidity. Where is the best place for me to get liquidity? It's very unlikely that the answer to all three of those questions are going to be the same spot. Yeah, and I really like the lens of this question because most of the time when people talk about kind of what the macro situation is, they're talking about how it affects crypto as an investment thesis. And so a lot of the things that people have speculated about the use case of crypto in an investment portfolio, such as it's an anti-correlated asset, it's an inflation hedge, uh, things like that, have kind of been disproven. But the, the idea of how the macro affects the market structure is one that's not really talked about that much. And I think that, you know, Phil is exactly right. Like one of the major themes now over the last six months is the impact of deleveraging and credit and the reduction of credit kind of across the space. And, you know, you'll see a lot less of the, you know, the way that this impacts market structure is that there's a lot less designs that are predicated on, you know, high leverage or derivatives of derivatives of derivatives. Um, which I think, you know, is going to create a lot more of a stable environment long term. The other thing that you see a lot when you have this macro environment where everything is going down is that there's a more, uh, there's a heightened focus on consumer protection. And certainly you're seeing that from a lot of the regulators. A lot of the regulators are taking the stance that we want to support, you know, the development, the innovation of blockchain technology. But we want to make sure that consumers are protected, uh, especially as like, the, you know, the assets, uh, all asset classes are going down. And one of the ways, the primary ways that this happens is um, an expectation of increased government intervention in markets. And I think we're starting to see that um, already. I think that's an excellent segue to two, two categories that we'll touch on today. Uh, first being credit. Credit contagion has most recently hit us. It's very fresh in everyone's mind. And it does feel like we've uh, gone through a similar cycle to what we've seen in financial markets in the 80s and you know, the two, uh, 2000s with uh, long-term capital management. And similarly, again, you're seeing uh, this play out again where uh, credit risk just blows out with certain parties being under collateralized. And then you see this massive ripple effect that has hit you know, all the way down to the retail that are then ultimate participants to products like the Celsius, participants in stablecoin projects such as Terra. So given that you know, virtually no lender has come out of this unscathed, you know, there's been no bailouts uh, in crypto as they have been in traditional markets. You know, what does this mean in the short term, short and medium term for, for participants of this space? Yeah, so I'll make a very obvious understatement. Uh, I think market participants in crypto um, really didn't spend enough time on risk management. Um, that's probably underselling it. Um, there are a lot of parts of crypto and any new asset class where, you know, the motto is move fast and break things. And that can even be true for parts of crypto. Um, but when it comes to someone who you have credit risk with, whether it's an exchange, whether it's an OTC liquidity provider, whether it's someone who you have a derivative deal with, you don't want them to move fast and break things. You want them to move very, very slow and be as careful as possible. Um, one of the benefits that we have, Cumberland is part of a company called DRW, which has been in financial markets for 35 years. So we are not building our risk systems from scratch. And in fact, we use the same risk team. We, I speak to the same people that are speaking to DRW. And a good risk team, they're not just asking questions when prices start moving. They're asking the questions that maybe the traders are not asking themselves. They're saying, well, what happens if this depairs? What happens if this moves like this? What happens if Bitcoin goes down 80% in a day? I think that when people are assessing credit risk in this space, a common mistake that they made is they said, okay, this is someone I wanna face because their AUM is X. When really the question that you should be asking is, what is their AU AUM going to be in this scenario that I should be afraid of? What is their AUM gonna be if crypto collapses? How much leverage do they have? How much of that AUM are they gonna lose for one reason or another? And at the end of the day, while the events of the past six months have been really rough for the entire industry, I think that the companies that are left are going to be a lot more mature about risk management. Um, and the companies that are left are also gonna be self-selected for the ones who have been mature about risk management. 
And at the end of the day, the sector is actually going to be a lot sturdier, a lot more resilient um, and more mature. I actually uh, have an interesting point on this because I agree with Paul on most of the points, but I actually think it's easy for, you know, Jane Street, you know, DRW, BTC2. Um, we, we do stress testing and everything, but this credit market contagion is very, very difficult as well because going back to the first point, valuation was hit. A lot of these companies are raising money. There's extensive due diligence there. So when you look at the financial statements, when you look at just the surface, you see, okay, well, you know, this counterparty is credit worthy. What happened in June was very interesting. Um, you know, you had this credit contagion happen and it kind of went into the governance, the risk management of that particular company, stuff that you don't really look at. So I think, you know, uh, Cumberland, you know, BTC2, we do, we do stress testing, we do all these things, we look at uh, the, the concentration matrix and everything, but it is extremely hard to build a proper credit risk model in a market like this. To go back to the original question, what I think is gonna happen in the near term and longer term, there's a massive need now for credit intermediaries because, you know, credit cannot be a reason why we say, okay, my NOP, you know, you're gonna have to over collateralize by 130, 140% because I trusted your balance sheet, but now I'm not really sure. That really stops the business. So I think in the medium term, we're gonna have to have these credit intermediaries. And like DRW and Cumberland, you know, we're owned by SBI. They can do parental guarantees here and there to select companies, but we can't just, they can't just do it for everybody, right? So we really need a centralized credit intermediary to make sure that the credit market flows right. And to the original point, there is no central bank. Like we're gonna have to figure this out. I mean, that's what I love about crypto. You know, that's, that's the innovation part. That's where we need to focus next. But it is a very, very tricky uh, problem to solve. But we're going to do it. And that's going to be the medium term solution, I think. Oh, yeah, I agree. And that's really exciting. That's the, that's a really exciting part of this. Because if you, you know, I'm going to make a very <laughs> gross over uh, generalization here, um, or oversimplification here. But essentially, there are two levers whenever you're talking about extended credit. One is collateralization and the other is identification. And obviously from an identification standpoint, you know, that's uh, a little bit tricky in, in, in a field like crypto where there's so much uh, emphasis on privacy. But, it, you know, the, the, the main issue from a, from a credit, perspective is if, credit perspective is if they both fall down. And we saw this in the housing crisis, in, in, in the great financial crisis in 2008. Like when everybody realized that all of these mortgage-backed securities were actually under collateralized, you know, there, you didn't have any recourse to the lender because they never did any kind of income checks on the lender. And so from the identification standpoint, and you, you include kind of risk checks, credit risk checks and things like that in the identification part. But, you know, I do think that at some point, you know, having somebody who actually understands how to do credit checks, how to understand how to do risk checks, uh, because I do think that a lot of the, you know, it's fine to lend uncollateralized if you are actually strong at doing the identification, doing the credit checks. And, you know, a lot of people didn't have that in their arsenal. But if you have like a significant credit intermediary, whether they do it on a credit basis, whether they do it on a pooled collateral basis, like uh, which a lot of the clearing houses are set up as, then I think that, you know, uh, we'll go a long way to solving this. And, you know, the crypto space is working on this problem of digital identification right now. It's a very, very big growth industry. Um, and so I do think that this will be solved over time, but that doesn't, you know, it, it's only a risk mitigant. It's not going to go away, do away with the entire kind of concept of credit prices. I guess in terms of what we observed with the, you know, the likes of Voyager and Celsius, was that the, I mean, in your thoughts sort of, Thomas, what, what, was, what was lacking the identification piece for them where people weren't able to properly assess, frankly, how things were being done behind the scenes? Yeah, and, you know, I don't want to assign blame because... You know, there are things that you can do, and uh, there are things that I think that they did do, which is like to try to check, you know, NABs and things like that. But, you know, on some level, there is an element of trust, which is really hard to build in a trustless system. And if, you know, if the, if the borrower is not providing the right documents and you have to make the choice from a business perspective, like, do I extend them credit or do I, do I not, then, you know... Uh, if you are focused on growth, then you know it's very easy to lose sight of, of the tail risks. No, absolutely. I think this, this sort of segues well into sort of the next piece of the discussion, which I think we sort of touched on the edges of, which was regulation. I think following this you know, large credit contagion, retail getting significantly affected, 
we're seeing arguably some of these regulators changing their stance. I was talking to Phil about, you know, backstage around a recent article that MAS put out, and the, the headline reads as follows, you know, yes to digital asset innovation, but no to cryptocurrency speculation, which I think for a, a lot of people uh, is confusing, given that people saw Singapore, saw MAS as like a very you know, forward financial hub, you know, this kind of statement might be considered a step back. So I'm very curious to get your thoughts on how such a statement is to be interpreted. You know, is this the regulator saying, I'm going to take a significant step back? Or is it saying, hey, maybe we should move a little bit slower. We shouldn't let growth sort of dictate the narrative of how uh, regulation looks. Yeah, so if at the end of the day, all the crypto market does is build a new product for people to trade and speculate in, I would say that as an industry, it's really failed. Um, there are so many people, so much talent has moved into this space over the past five, 10 years, that if crypto achieves anything less than changing the world, anything less ambitious, I think is, is just a complete failure. In Cumberland, DRW, we've been liquidity providers. That's, that's really our bread and butter. That's really our ethos. For the past 35 years, we think that there is a real strong public good served by liquidity providers providing consistent, um, reliable liquidity, even in the worst market conditions. That's the thing that we do. Um, if anyone is a liquidity provider maxi, uh, it would be Cumberland DRW. And even from that maxi position, we still see that it's necessary to do more than just trading in this space. It's necessary from the position that we're sitting in to actually be builders as well. That's why we have a venture team, uh, which is investing in projects in the space. Uh, that's why we have Cumberland Labs, which is a recently launched incubator, which is going to be building products in the space because we really think that if you have that understanding, that technological know-how, that markets structure know-how, um, then you have to be doing more than just trading the space. You also have to be building the products, you know, build the products that you would find useful and then give it to other people and that should advance the market. Yeah, and um, maybe I'll go into a little bit in terms of view. This is my personal view. Um, you know, all three of us up, up here are liquidity providers, and I think we're very proud of providing the gateway to crypto. Without liquidity, can't access crypto. And if you look at, you know, the spreads, compression, the liquidity in the market, it's great. And I think, you know, we can credit ourselves for building that, building that out. But for the next probably six months or so, you know, maybe a little bit more, I think speculative volume, especially from retail, is going to go down. So where am I focused on? I'm actually quite interested in the build out of like STOs. I think it's a great opportunity right now. Why? Because if interest rates are going up, debt financing is going up, a lot of these projects and a lot of these companies are looking at alternatives now. We've talked about STOs for quite some time. And I think the innovation piece in crypto, in this digital asset, is, is quite large. Now, I've been speaking to a lot of, I'm based in Tokyo, and I've been speaking to a lot of these large Japanese asset managers, real estate managers, um, and, and other kind of mega project guys, and we're talking about potentially looking at STOs. What I can tell you is one of the first questions they ask is, well, what about liquidity in the secondary market? We can't split innovation and speculation. It, you know, innovation is coming and innovation is there. And a lot of the macro factors that we talked about in the first question, I think will eventually lead to the build out of more, you know, debt token, uh, real estate, you know, token and tokenization of assets and stuff in the right way. Um, but then we need to come in and we need to be able to provide the liquidity. And that is being driven by speculation. So there's no way you can split it and say two different things. We're going to accept innovation, but no to, to, to speculation. Well, and I think, you know, just to just to take a bit of a step back, I think that, you know, I, I, the regulators' jobs are a lot harder than I think a lot of people realize. Because, you know, for people who are in this room, uh, the regulators feel very kind of staid and, and backwards. But I think the, the right lens to look at this is that the regulators are not trying to create rules to protect you guys. They're trying to protect your parents or your grandparents or people that you have tried unsuccessfully over the years to, to, to understand and describe like what is actually happening in crypto. And you know, it's, it's very, very difficult for people who are on the outside to actually understand the depth and, and how much 
uh, of a paradigm shift this actually is in the way that you know you not only conduct finance but in fundamentally in the way that a lot of things are going to work and so the regulators are trying really hard to protect them while still keeping the door open for everybody in this room to work on the projects that are actually going to you know lay the groundwork for the future uh, and it's a tricky balance. They're very likely going to get, you know, it's a pendulum. They're going to kind of miss on both sides of the pendulum. But, you know, hopefully over time, because firms like ours, because people in this room are engaging with regulators and helping them understand the challenges and helping them understand the value proposition that, you know, that hopefully will work together towards a brighter future. So it seems like speculation is something that almost can't be unbundled from innovation is what I'm hearing. Is that, some, is that a necessary evil? that encourages, and maybe that's a very controversial question, but is that something that's needed to sort of perpetuate liquidity? Uh, I mean, are you saying speculation is evil? Because I would disagree with that statement. Yeah, no, it's a, a, yeah please <laughs> challenge that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and, and this kind of ties into this idea of credit. You know, this idea, you know, one thing that is important to understand credit is this, and, and you know, ultimately the, the role of credit that credit plays in speculation is in the velocity of money. And if you think about it, like velocity of money is very simply like how quickly like a dollar moves through the, you know, through the, the entire system. And so you pay your employees, your employee pays rent, they pay, you know, they pay the dry cleaners, they pay for goods and services. And then, you know, the, those vendors go and they pay, you know, for supplies, et cetera, et cetera. And how quickly that money moves through the system, a lot of that is what drives um, is what drives innovation and speculation, and credit is an absolutely integral part of that. Because if you have to wait until all of your vendors pay, then you can't actually pay your employees. And then what happens? Uh, where in and innovation is an important part of that because in order to drive innovation, like somebody has to take a risk, they have to borrow money in order to implement some of the things that you want. And you know the danger when it comes to the restriction of credit, when it comes to some sort of friction that's introduced by some of the regulators, is that you know the velocity of money stops because something happens. And, you know that's part of the reason why deflationary uh, deflation is so destructive is because it stops consumer spending. And so you know as credit restricts, then you have less capacity to actually go out and borrow money uh, to buy the equipment now that you can kind of finance down the road. And so the idea of speculation. And innovation, I think, are, I think, I think you basically said this, like they're two sides of the same coin. You can't actually innovate, you can't question the current status quo without some layer of fundamentally asking, why are we doing things and is there a better way to do things? And I think that's what speculation is, like this idea of like, can we build a better system? Can we build a better model? Can we build a better world? And, you know, so the idea that speculation and innovation kind of are at odds with each other, I, I would disagree with. And, you know, I, I think that everybody in this room has taken a very, very significant speculative leap at some point. Um, and I think that, you know, the idea that this is uh, somewhat destructive, I mean, certainly it can be if you're doing things that you don't understand and you're over leveraging yourself. Um, but uh, system wide, I think it's important. So I guess that's why we're all here, right? Um... I think in the time that we have left, we'll quickly change lanes. I think Paul sort of touched on this in terms of these liquidity providers also investing in bringing the best practices to support you know, this, this new area in the form of, you know, whether it's venture, infrastructure. Uh, I'm very curious to get a sense of, you know, in the near term, crypto resembles a, a short term, almost like macro speculative asset. But in the long term, there's almost decade long technology uh, roadmaps. So, as you know, large institutions, how do you see yourselves as being part of that 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 journey? Yeah, I, I, I can take this. So, one of our key roles in the market, one in particular, what I spend a lot of my, my time doing, uh, is speaking to firms that are coming from traditional finance and figuring out what is the proper way um, to enter the crypto markets. It's, you know, one of the things that we see right now in crypto in the past is. If a company is trading or if they're involved in crypto, that is what they're doing as a company and that's the only thing. There's not a lot of companies that are saying, okay, we're coming from this background and we're approaching it in a different way. And if we want growth as an industry and this is, you know, this is the way that we try to raise the tide that's gonna lift all boats is bringing other institutions and basically making crypto a lot more mainstream by getting these institutions involved and understanding the questions that they are going to have on day one 
you know, going from day one when they're saying, okay, what's the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, to coming to the end when they're saying, okay, what's the difference between custodial and non-custodial? Um, what's the difference between, you know, trading, uh, trading via exchanges or trading via an ISDA, right? Answering those questions. And so generally the way that we try to help these companies enter the space properly, and back to a point that I made earlier, you know, we're not trying to do every piece of this ourselves. And we've worked with a lot of the infrastructure providers outside of liquidity provision. Um, and we say, okay, these are the companies that you're gonna need to speak to. These are the tools that you're gonna need to have and kind of trying to guide them towards um, who over time and trial and error, we figured out, okay, these are, these are the, the healthy players in the space. Yeah, and uh, I guess uh, from a very large perspective, um, I have a few, you know, this is very theoretical, theoretical, I guess, but I think first you need to have liquidity, you need the foundation, and then you start building out the gateway to, to the asset class. Um, in that sense, what we're doing is we've built out, you know, we have the spot liquidity, we have the derivative stuff. Now what we're working on is uh, a little bit the second level in my view, which is private order books. You want to limit your uh, uh, exposure and you want to limit your hand, you want to limit your market impact. So we're delivering a private order book very soon. Uh, then we're looking at delivering the first electronically delivered option chain. So you can actually look at the option chain on an OTC base. Right now you want to trade options, you go to Deribit. It's an exchange-based trading. I'm a big believer, and this could be just be me coming from FX, but there's over 450 exchanges in the world right now, crypto exchanges. I'm a huge believer in OTC. And I think the three of us are definitely big OTC guys, right? So right now we're, we're building out this, this still in the process of building out all the product and services that's necessary in the OTC space so that it's easy for everybody else to come in because exchange is great for retail, it does not work for institution. You need consistent liquidity, you need the product and services that institutions need, and, and so on and so on. Now, one thing that I will touch though, uh, in terms of innovation, I'm a big believer in securitization of assets, and I think that has to come next. Uh, that's why, uh, personally, even at BC2, we're starting to focus more on looking at debt token issuance at looking at securitization of assets, because once the liquidity is there, you know, that's not the end of our story, right? The innovation, I think, really comes from the securitization. And, and that's, that's my big bet that, you know, uh, in the next few years, we have to focus on. Yeah, and I know uh, everybody else has been talking about liquidity, but I think that, you know, it's important to understand that one of the, <laughs> one of the absolute kind of fundamental underpinnings of capital markets is the idea of entry and exit points. Like, especially in an institutional side, uh, they care about, like, entry, like if I were to invest 1% of my portfolio in Bitcoin, like how much impact would I have? And then once you place the investment, like what is the exit? Like, am I going in a stress scenario? Like, am I going to be able to exit an investment? If you're starting a company, a lot of your employees are going to care about like, what's the exit scenario? Are you going to sell yourself? Are you going to, um, you know, list, go public, things like that. And so the, you absolutely have to have a good story for both entry and exit. And liquidity, liquidity is absolutely essential to making that story possible. Like if uh, I'm sure everybody here has, you know, <laughs> some tokens in their bags that they're dying to get rid of, but they can't find a bid. And that's the, that's, you know, if in that context, it's very easy to understand why liquidity, it, it, liquidity is valuable. Uh, but the other thing that, you know, that we're also trying to do and very much uh, like the other panelists are, is that, you know, we have over 20 years of experience in financial markets. And one thing that we've realized in crypto particularly is that we have a lot of market structure and product structure expertise. We've seen a lot of experiments succeed and fail in other asset classes. And we can leverage that when we talk to people who are doing this kind of intense experimentation in the crypto space and lend some of our expertise. And you know, we have a pretty strong capital base now, so we can lend some capital. We can provide a little bit of guidance to help uh, mature the space. And you know, if anybody is in that bucket, please you know feel free to come talk to us. Any any of us. It's, to that point, there's there's a lot of crypto that is new and new things being built, new ways of trading. But there's also a lot of it that the the wheel does not have to be reinvented. Um, one of the one of the ways that we provide liquidity is the most tradfi thing you could possibly do, which is via an ISDA. Um, and this is not nearly as exciting. Like I'm a DeFi guy. That's that's how I like to think about crypto and. But at the end of the day, you know, when you're talking about bringing institutions into the space, they want to trade the same way that they're comfortable, that they've been trading in traditional asset classes. Um, so, okay, 
FX traders have traded via NISDA before, and so they have the same structure here. And all of a sudden, it abstracts away a lot of the differences, a lot of the things that they're going to have to spend a lot of time getting comfortable with. And they say, okay, it's an ISDA. There's an underlying index. And at the end of the day, we're going to cash that all to something that's based on that. And all of a sudden, the market doesn't seem so new and scary. It seems like, okay, this is just another thing that our team can trade. Uh, uh, great way to conclude, guys. I know we've gone a little bit over and we could probably go for the next hour. But everyone, please join me in thanking our panelists for their time today.